Welcome. Welcome to this event today, marking International Women's Day. In the name of the European Parliament and its office in London, I'm very pleased to host this event on female leadership in times of crisis, and thank you all for joining. This event is part of our series, Parliaments in Dialogue, bringing together members of the European Parliament and the UK Parliament to exchange views on issues of common concern, interest and values. The current COVID crisis has seen an increased unequal burden placed upon women in both our health services and voluntary organizations, but also at home, where many had to juggle work, homeschooling and ca being carers. But we have also seen truly inspirational and reassuring leadership by women in dealing with the pandemic and its consequences. The discussion today will address how leaders, how female leaders are responding to this crisis and whether the qualities which are often associated with them, decisiveness, empathy, compassion, efficiency, and perhaps most importantly of all, the ability to communicate in an open and clear manner can be further utilized in building back better. I'm very pleased that we have with us today a very distinguished panel to address these questions. Heidi Hautala is a Finnish member of the European Parliament. She had a long career in Finnish politics, being a member of parliament, a minister, and in the European Parliament has served in in, in all positions of influence, being a leader of a political group, the Green Group, uh, being a committee chair and now a vice president. Um, she is joined by Caroline Nooks, who is the chair of the House of Commons uh, Select Committee on Women and Equality. Um, Caroline had a, a long and distinguished career in local politics before uh, joining the House of Commons and being a member of uh, Theresa May's government. Both are joined today from Amman by Leila Nafa, the Director of Programs of the Arab Women's Institute of Jordan, who will be able to bring to the discussion her vast experience on the ground in a very challenging environment. The discussions will be moderated by Mega Mohan, the BBC's gender and uh, identity correspondent, who has recently produced an acclaimed documentary on the female-led coalition government in Finland. So before handing over to Mega now, I just wanted to announce that um, you are all very welcome also to join in later this afternoon at 16 hours uh, UK time to the opening of the plenary session in Brussels where President Sassoli and President von der Leyen will be joined by video messages from New Zealand by Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern and uh, the US Vice President Kamala Harris. So please join in and I wish us all a very interesting and stimulating discussion. Thank you all and thank you the panel. Thank you, Suzanne. That was a brilliant introduction of everyone. You've saved me that job, which is, which I'm always happy with people who saved me a job, but I'm gonna, so I'm gonna start by asking a question to the panel. And uh, if we can get the answers in the order of Heidi first and then Caroline and then Leila. We're talking about female leadership. Now I, I find this concept quite a curious one. I don't know if I would be able to answer what female leadership means. What, what would you say, Heidi, in terms of that definition? Yeah, thank you. Of course, there are, uh, as we know, it goes without saying that we have exceptions to all directions. We have a real diversity of leaderships. But I, I have learned during my political career that um, women uh, as leaders are often more interactive less authoritarian, they, they keep their doors open for, for their, their uh, teams and employees. And um, that um, they simply um, bring their everyday life experience more to politics than uh, men have used to do that. But so having said that, I must say that uh, in Finland, almost no man gets elected if they can show that they iron their own shirts, you know, and not, not have a wife to do that. Or maybe they do that in secret, the wives. But So um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's uh, interaction, compassion, more sort of, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, yes, more exchanges, 
and learning by doing, learning by talking and listening, not always being the, the, the sort of the authoritarian voice to start with. But when uh, women leaders have made up their minds, having listened to a lot of uh, different stakeholders and people, they usually will just start acting. Uh, Heidi, I'll ask you specifically about um, about Finland and female leadership later. But Caroline, what, would you like to pick on um, pick that up? We've we've had two female leaders in this country. Um, we what have does indeed. female leadership mean to to you? And I can only give the observation of female leadership from Theresa May's time as Prime Minister. And I would say that the thing that really came home to me was that it was inclusive. And it was about making sure that all the voices around the table were listened to. I think Heidi said that as well. It's about listening. And I think she makes a very good observation is that female leaders uh, learn through listening. Sometimes they learn through making mistakes and they change and they're not afraid to admit that something hasn't worked. So you try a new path, a new tactic. And I think what matters to me is that it's not so much about whether your leaders are male or female, but that there is a balance and that voices from all parts of the country, from all communities, from both genders, from young and old are included and reflected upon. And I think certainly through the pandemic, what I have been very afraid of is some communities being left behind, being uh, left out, excluded. And that's not acceptable and it cannot continue and in the 21st century we have to make sure that existing inequalities are not exacerbated by whatever crisis is thrown at us. So I think for me what matters most is that all voices are able to express themselves and are heard equally. And Leila, in terms of the Arab countries that you're you're looking at, what does leadership mean, female leadership to you? Well, uh, for me, uh, I, I think courage is the word that this part of the world that uh, female leaders need. And this is how female leaders show, because uh, whenever they take a courageous stand in a very, very conservative society, uh, very, very uh, strict towards women's issues, women's liberty, so they give insight into the whole problem and they encourage other women to to join because uh, of the lot of pressure all over women in our part of the world so this is how i imagine they that they have you know the courage in, in the new generation i, I find that there is a, a new trend uh, that that women are they go by the book uh, if in a man, for example, uh, you meet a policewoman, yeah, you try as a driver to avoid them because uh, it is finished, no compromise. And this is how I, I think uh, uh, it is a little bit of a, of a reaction. It is not uh, a bit of established leadership. This so is I, how I feel. I feel as though all three... Um, members of our panel here have talked about anecdotal examples of female leadership. Are there, so if we, if we can stay on that point for a moment, is that an example that you, all three of you could give, or one of you could give about your time in leadership where you worked with a female leader and you felt that there was a marked difference in, in how a, you know, a particular issue was dealt with than you felt that would have been handled with a with a man. Heidi? Um, well, I'd, I'd rather say that um, my, my first experiences of uh, women leadership were uh, from uh, civil society groups. We were, uh, we were a group of Finnish women who were opposing nuclear energy and, and we had a lot of uh, creativity and imagination. But um, what was typical of, of that time was that um, leadership kind of rotated, you know, somebody had a vision and uh, was able to argue for the others that this is what we will do next. And then we followed, but then maybe there was another one. So depending on the situation, but I, I must say that I, I haven't been uh, working under a female prime minister, but, and, and I, I should tell you on this International Women's Day uh, from the European Parliament, 
that it's 20 years ago that the European Parliament had, had a female uh, president. Mm. And uh, this is, of course, something that is really striking and it has to change. So I very much wish that I would be able to work also under uh, women, women sort of um, heads of, of organizations. And I'm, I'm, of course, trying to do that <laughs> to, to, to get those. What about you, Caroline? Um, so I just want to pick up on the point that you made about anecdote. And I think that that's a really fair comment, absolutely accurate. And the observation that I would make is that I have worked under uh, female leaders, both a prime minister and indeed a home secretary mm -hmm. who was a woman who would be influenced by what they had experienced. So actually they would bring their own lives into their own constituencies, the, the struggles that they saw women around them experiencing, and they would bring that into the role that they had. And whilst one cannot uh, divulge what happens in cabinet, I think it is fair to say that when uh, Theresa May was prime minister, I can remember a discussion in cabinet around domestic abuse and violence against women and girls. And I have never seen her so, uh, so passionate when she spoke, but so angry when few men around the table did speak. And I thought that that was incredibly um, telling that for her, this was an issue that men needed to care about every bit as much as women. And it was something that was really, you know, in her, it burnt, it really burnt that this was something that we had to make progress on. And of course, she was the prime minister that tried several times to introduce a domestic abuse bill uh, that we really struggled to get through uh, commons due to, you know, political events that were so tumultuous and difficult at that time. But for her, it remained a huge passion. And when she brought it or when it came back uh, under Boris Johnson's leadership, she was one of the first members of parliament by then a backbencher to stand up and speak and bring again the passion that she had had first as a Home Secretary, then as a Prime Minister, to make sure that we were doing more to address uh, violence and abuse against women. And I think, you know, this is something that I will always hold up as an example is of her genuine, um, I'm not going to just say belief, but care. She really cared. And I think that that is a, a huge attribute that so many female leaders have. There are two aspects that I want to, um, later, I'm going to throw this to you as well, but there are two aspects that I wanted to pick up on, which we've spoken about before. One being domestic abuse, which I think the whole panel can talk about in terms of um, what we've seen compounded during this time of um, crisis. In, we've talked about inequality during um, the coronavirus pandemic, and that has been displayed globally through the rise in, in um, domestic abuse in countries. But one other thing that you were talking about, Caroline, was um, the issue of representation of, of women and what, and, and what that kind of, what that means um, it, from a leadership point of view. So where we stand right now with the European Parliament, there are 38, um, it's 38% women in, you know, represented in, um, European Parliament. It's, that it's gone great... to over 40 now, which is... Uh, no, it's January. Little. No, 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 no. It was um, over 40 um, three months ago, January 2021 at okay. 38. Um, but this varies greatly between member states um, as well. So we've got Malta at 50%, um, Cyprus at zero. What, what does what does rep later what does represent because you work a lot with civil society what does representation mean in terms of of um in, in terms of sort of leadership when you are working in civil society and engaging with with leaders yeah uh, it is part of our program if I speak about civil society that the presentation for me should be should increase and increase because we do have, for example, in Jordan, we do have a quota, see. And this was uh, on oh, our- Sorry, I, I missed it. It's a quota, uh, special seats for women. Yes. Uh, it's usually with percentage, but in our case, it is a uh, number of seats. Uh, in the municipalities, we do have it in percentage in the law, but in the parliament, it is not that, uh, you know, clear. Uh, now, if I give you examples from the Arab world, many of the constitutions say uh, parity, parity uh, is the, uh, or shall we say towards parity, this is how they put it. So it is there, the, the representation. But 
uh, in reality, in reality, uh, the role uh, played in such had a, uh, is not uh, well by, uh, shall we say, qualified uh, leaders. You know, usually they distribute the quota as the case in Jordan. They distribu distribute it to different provinces and there are weak women, strong women. But I can give an example of, of a woman who came from a province, and, but maybe because her background is a lawyer, she could make it and she stayed systematic. And, and all the time people, after three rounds in the parliament, she's not there anymore and she chose not to be. Uh, uh, she, people could predict that she will vote here and not there. She, if it is the budget, she will refuse. When it comes to, uh, I'm sorry to say that, uh, uh, they, they say men, they, they compromise sometimes, they, they maneuver sometimes, they play politics. But when it comes to women, and this uh, parliamentarian in particular, uh, she, uh, she never maneuvers. I, I mean, when it comes to principles, when it comes. So this is the kind of leadership, which is, as I said before, it is, you know, on principle and strictness, uh, sort of, in our part of the world. For us in the civil society, we like this type of leadership, to be clear, not to compromise, and figures in such a field uh, are uh, respected more. I I'm sorry to say that, but it is strictness. I wonder if we're being unfair here to, <laughs> ma to male leaders uh, as a group, because do, I mean, are we saying that female leaders mean that female issues are brought to the forefront? We've had Caroline talk about um, Theresa May's passion for domestic um, but, well, no, that's, maybe I'll reword that, <laughs> a passion for issues concerning um, domestic violence. But, Heidi, we, I spent um, time in Finland last year. I was, I was lucky enough to spend time with the, with the whole of the coalition government, all five female leaders. And, yeah, I was quite um, shocked by the levels of domestic violence yeah. in the country and a, a kind of, a, a, and, and sort of, you know, quite large gaps when it appeared on what was being done about it as well. I, I think you're right. I think, in fact, um, before the EU started uh, to to act on uh, domestic violence in the mid 90s, I think it was a bit of a taboo, and it was a hidden taboo uh, at, at um, in in the private domestic space. But that is uh, fortunately not at all the case now. And I would say that. Um, uh, there's a um, clear um, awareness of the need to also deal with the, the, uh, uh, the criminal sanctions on, on this issue. And uh, we have to uh, be able to provide uh, enough shelters for, for women. It, in, in a very small minority of cases, it could, of course, be also men that are victims. We know that from all over the world. But um, yes, it is a problem. And um, I think it's, uh, it's very good to be open about it and, and need to act and in different uh, budget negotiations, it's been quite uh, fundamental. And this is what the, the women's movement have been uh, and authorities have been demanding all through is that there needs to be enough money for the shelters. And uh, sa uh, sadly, we know that the COVID crisis has reduced funds and also increased the cases of domestic violence. So this is definitely something that needs to be addressed. And Finland is, a, is an ardent proponent of uh, the uh, Istanbul Convention, unlike some European Union member states, uh, especially in central and eastern part of Europe. So I think uh, it's, we know that there is a problem. We want to address it. We want to eradicate it. What about you, Caroline? What about um, issues of domestic violence in, in um, this country? Because one of the things that we found that's happening in Western countries, which is actually opposite to Arab countries, is that during times, uh, during the pandemic, you know, instances of um, violence was, went down, I mean, as in being reported, went down because people were trapped with their abusers. So what, what are we doing here to, to um, directly address that issue? So some really important initiatives, and you're absolutely right to highlight that uh, victims were in many instances trapped 24 seven 
with somebody who was abusing them. So we have introduced all sorts of campaigns across pharmacists. Uh, there's the Ask Annie campaign, which it gives people uh, victims a code word to say to uh, staff working in their local pharmacy. There was some brilliant work done by the transport network to enable uh, victims of domestic abuse to travel for free fleeing from their situations. Now, we all recognize, uh, and we are in privileged positions, so we can recognize that, that for the victims of domestic abuse, it is very hard to make that decision to flee, perhaps particularly in a time of pandemic because uh, so many things are uncertain and we know that women have been uh, disempowered financially uh, and that they, in many instances, have uh, carried the largest share of responsibility for childcare, for homeschooling, for keeping uh, households up and running. And yet at the same time, we saw this dreadful spike in domestic abuse and, a, and an inability to report it. And there were some great initiatives around uh, reporting by text message, reporting online, so that you didn't have to make a phone call. It's much easier to do it on an app, uh, a few clicks on your phone, rather than actually be potentially caught making phone call, but I was pleased uh, that very early on in the pandemic, the British government recognized that there was a problem, put in additional funding. Of course, it is never enough. Uh, and that's the stark reality is that uh, this is a sector which has been um, very difficult to sustain the funding for over a long period. They're now seeing a rise in the number of cases that they have to deal with and the complexity of cases. And talking within my own lo local authority, they have highlighted to me not only an increase in uh, abuse against women, but increase in uh, abuse against children. Um, mm -hmm. And that is absolutely terrifying and appalling. And clearly, when the pandemic is over, there is going to be an enormous piece of work to be done to make sure that we put in place the structures that will be there in future, that will be enduring and sustainable, um, because this is a huge, um, a huge, I was going to say national malaise, it's not, it's global. Um, and I'm just relieved that finally we have a, a domestic abuse bill that looks like it's going to complete its mm -hmm. commons or complete its parliamentary passage, that it will become legislation. But as I always say, that's that's one piece of legislation. And we have to remain vigilant to the way threats change, uh, adapt. You know, who would have thought 10, 20 years ago that we would have been discussing uh, things like the sharing of intimate images online as a form of domestic abuse? Who would have thought that we would have been talking about financial control, coercive control in as candid and as detailed a way as we have now learned about it? Um, and so I always say this this bill currently making its way through uh, the Houses of Parliament is a really important step. I celebrate it, I welcome it. But as soon as that has royal assent, I have no doubt people like me will be campaigning for the next piece of legislation. Do you think it's fair to say that that was shepherded it under male leadership? It, it didn't matter whether there, was, there were female leaders at the table at that point. The work started with a female leader at the table, and I would always point out ministers like Victoria Atkins, Susan Williams, who have been steering it through both the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Um, but I don't think it mattered. Don't think it matters that we have a male prime minister and we have a female home secretary and it's in her department that this legislation is coming forward. Um, but equally, we have a male transport secretary who worked with all of the rail companies to make sure the victims could flee. We have a male uh, communities and local government secretary working to put the funding into refuge. So I think um, what this has been is a, a cross-gender initiative, thank goodness, because we need, we need men to be on our side as well. I want to ask Leila this next question, but really I'd like all three of you to jump in at any point, which is the four of us speaking right now, we arguably are in positions of, of leadership. And for me, I know that I had an incredibly strong grandmother and um, mother that supported me, that, that just really allowed me access to education, stressed the importance of autonomy and allowed me to, to find my voice and not be embarrassed when I made mistakes and all of that, you know, all of the kind of things that lead to leadership. But we, I, we still need, I, I think, as a, as a global society, need to talk about what blocks to leadership there are for women you know access to resources access to you know seeing more women like you in panels like this where we're not siloed off to 
just the women's day chat but you know we could we can come on and talk about yeah. you know any issues um Leila what what do you what would you say are the blocks that you're seeing to leadership for for women that you're speaking to well I, I can speak of so many uh, things but uh, what is uh, happening in our part of the world is that there is a very big backlash you know uh, women all over the world I have been you know, keeping even before the pandemic, are are speaking about backlash, and uh, you know, uh, uh, we're not uh, building on the achievements that women ha have taken, and now we see it in the pandemic that the domestic uh, violence is increasing. But uh, but in uh, in our in our society, it is the entrenched uh, social norms. Uh, that nobody is courageous to, uh, shall we say, put an end or help in putting an end to it. It is so much uh, taking our energy and taking our effort. Let me give an example of what happened during the pandemic. Women became really invis invisible. We know part of the statistics that 70% uh, of women work in the health uh, sector and uh, over that you know similar number about the teaching uh, education in education but these women are, are are not given the chance to speak to appear on the television uh, if i tell you that it is 100 percent men appear on our television in jordan every night giving instructions giving health uh, shall we say uh, tricks or whatever is given and no women appear, uh, whereas uh, they are at the front line uh, and uh, now the caring uh, burden at home is increasing for even working mothers because of uh, education uh, uh, through the computer. It is uh, online uh, education is there. So the, the caring burden is there, the, the um, invisibility is not understood. Uh, people in Jordan know that women are highly educated and they participate in work, but still uh, there it is at the, shall we say, uh, back of the head that uh, 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 women are not given the chance. They are not given the priorities. Uh, it happened also that uh, during the severe closure at the beginning of, of the pandemic, that they did not open the centers for contraceptives. Mm -hmm. and all, yes, and it is all, uh, it depends on us and the civil society. We need to open it, not only for children to take the vaccine at, at the uh, right time, but also open it for women who cannot buy the contraceptives from the ph pharmacies. And this used to be a success story in Jordan that every uh, uh, medical center gives the contraceptives. And after we finished uh, with that success story, something came to, to break down uh, what we have built. You see now the, the idea is that they don't take serious uh, even you know things that affect the whole society. They, they don't uh, consider it as a big issue. We have emergency, nobody to speak about women's rights. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give you an idea that it is still very strict in our society uh, in the sense that social norms are uh, taken for granted that women, that men are, are, are the leaders. I think this that's a really good I, example. I, I, of, I think that's a really great yeah. example of not being taken seriously um, as a block to leadership. What would you say to that, um, Caroline, in, in terms of what do you think the blocks are here? Uh, so I think there, there are a number of blocks here. I think there is still a financial block to women. Uh, and it is incredibly difficult in the UK to be able to take time out of your career. Uh, I dedicated eight years of my life to campaigning to win my seat in Parliament. Um, and I'm always completely candid about that. It would have been impossible to do without my father. Uh, absolutely impossible. So I owe him a huge debt, not only of gratitude, but probably financially. 
Uh, but I think what I saw at the last election in this country was um, great women, really talented, brilliant, strong women uh, in parliament choosing to quit and citing as the reason why they were standing down, the amount of abuse that they got on social media, uh, the fact that they had to develop a much thicker skin to be able to tolerate that. Uh, and I always say that is that the, the woman that I am today is a very different woman to the one I was 11 years ago when I was first elected and that it takes, it takes a serious level of abuse for me to even notice now. Mostly I just shrug it off, but not every woman can do that. Not every person can do that. Not everyone feels the same way. Oh. And I think nor should you have to necessarily well, to normalize bad behavior. Uh, and I think that the, the level of discourse that we see on social media has degenerated to such a level that it deters anybody, both men and women, from seeking uh, a role in public life. And that's just wrong. If you are to have a functioning democracy, you need a breadth of uh, politicians. You need to have diversity, choice, people of different experiences, different backgrounds, different ethnicities, people with disabilities. And you know what? At the end of the day, too many good people look at those challenges and go, it's just not for me. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that we as uh, politicians and leaders therefore have to have to raise the bar, have to make sure that our engagements uh, on social media are setting a standard that, uh, that others can follow. And I, it's very hard to do. Um, but I always tell everybody that the mute and the block button, they are your friends. The mute button is definitely a friend. I just want to remind our viewers that you can send in questions to, um, to us, which I can put forward to our brilliant panel here. I might read one out in a minute, but Heidi, I just wanted to pick up on Caroline and Leila's point um, to ask you. We know that you, in fact, when I was in Finland, um, it was hard to get hold of one of the special advisors to one of the ministers because he was on paternity leave because he was sharing it with, yeah. um, with, with his wife. So he's like, oh, no, I have to go. I'm, I'm, on, I'm technically still on paternity leave. And, and so, you know, I've, I've negotiated a day with my wife. So is that, are we supposed to, do you think the, the Finnish model is the answer, shared paternal and maternal, maternal leaves? Two of the leaders in the coalition government came from single parent families with substance abuse, um, you know, relying on welfare. Um, is that, are you the, are you the answer? Um, I think it's, um, let's say, a, a Nordic tradition. Um, we started to emphasize um, balancing between work and family, work and private life. But I think this idea has, um, has found itself into the EU as well. So, um, and I, of course, am very aware that the, the UK has always been uh, in the forefront of, of uh, defending uh, progressive uh, e gender equality policies in the EU. And I count on you to continue to work with us, even if you're not anymore in the EU. But clearly uh, this question of um, engaging um, fathers in, um, in the um, parental leaves is, is a key one. But uh, there's an economic reality why this has been slow, because often still we have the gender pay gap, which means that um, it's, um, if you calculate, if you count the economic uh, outcome of a paternity leave from the family point of view, you will notice that um, it, is, um, it is costing the family more. So we need to address the gender gap. And I'm very happy to see that today, um, what we discuss in the European Parliament is, is new measures to, to, to fight this pervasive pay gap and, and gender segregation of professional life. But yes, I believe it's, it's wonderful to see that in so many countries now, it, is, it looks so natural that, uh, that fathers are in the playground with their ch small children. I wonder how, uh, Leila, how in, in Jordan this kind of things are developing. But let me add one issue to the, our debate, because today we could also celebrate those courageous women who are fighting for uh, democratic rights in authoritarian countries, even in military dictatorships like Myanmar. But you can, you can also take into account Belarus and Russia, Thailand. And I, I think we're seeing extraordinary generations of, of women now standing up as, uh, as social leaders. And I think it gives me some hope that, um, that we would still be on the way towards a more democratic world with, with women rising to the top. But yes, I, I'm really curious about Jordan and uh, and balancing family and work. 
Well, uh, if I may say that uh, when it comes to the civil society, it is more oriented to what is happening in the world. And uh, when it comes to 8th of March, in particular, uh, it, it is uh, like uh, raising awareness all the time that it, it was... Inter sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Leila, but specifically in terms of childcare mm. and paternity leave, is that is that what... Because I don't know the answer to that either. What happens when a working woman has a child in, um, in Jordan? What happens with childcare? Yeah, but I, I wanted to say that it was introduced by a woman. But what happened is that every workplace, it is in the law in Jordan, that they should have a nursery. It is, uh, it is uh, uh, even I know by heart the number of, of, of the article in the law, but nobody is following that. Mm -hmm. And uh, recently in the year 2019, we had a paternity leave for the father, and it was for three days. We consider that as a step forward. But when it comes to reality now, when it comes to private sector, uh, they neglect it, they, they don't abide by it. And the, the idea is that no uh, monitoring is, is done by the government over, over what the private sector is uh, doing. Now, uh, with the... With the uh, new developments, uh, other Arab countries took it, and this helps us. You know, whatever uh, is done in Egypt affects us a lot, whatever is done in other countries. But what I wanted to say that even, and this is the, what I wanted to say, the value of having 8th of March, is that we are affected by, by the, what happens in the European countries. And this is our story. Now, uh, all the women's uh, movement inside Jordan are calling for, for, for uh, abiding by the law for the nurseries in place of work. Uh, they, they try not only to enforce the law, but also to find solutions. Like if two factories are close together, it might, there might be a common nursery. They, they are trying to help in, in the childcare in such a way. But for us, even the law is, is, is not uh, applied. I'm, so, I'm sorry, this is the situation. Mm -hmm. what, what comes to be, yeah, what comes to being put down in practice to what is theory is often, is often two very, very different things. So we've got a couple of questions coming through. One, um, is a question from Dr. James. Does the fact that the life biography of women is by and large, and in most cases, very different from that of men affect leadership? Which is, I think we sort of touched on that earlier, but um, Caroline, do you want to, do you want to um, answer that? Does your, do you feel personally as a, as a female leader that your experiences, your gendered experiences of growing up Oh, um, so. um, and I could get quite cross and touchy about the question, actually, uh, because why should they? And I know that I am uh, incredibly blessed as uh, and I always tell people this, the younger daughter of a man who only had daughters uh, who served in the European Parliament for 10 years. Uh, and I was utterly convinced that the only limit on what I would achieve was not my life biography, but what, how hard I was prepared to work. Um, and then and then I arrived in Parliament in 2010 and I suddenly discovered that there were expectations. And before I came here, I led a, an organisation that only employed women. Uh, accidentally, that wasn't a deliberate policy, but it was a, a group of fantastic women that I worked with. And I was really stunned to discover that in Parliament, you know, in the mother of all parliaments, that there were expectations placed upon me about the things I would speak on, the issues I would raise because I was a woman. Uh, and that really surprised me because as far as I was concerned, you know, I would talk on the issues that I cared about that were of interest to my constituency. You know, it's a big rural area. So if I wanted to talk on farming, I would. Uh, I had a long history in local government, perhaps not particularly orientated towards women. And I thought that, that was where uh, I could speak with some uh, interest and knowledge. 
Um, and I would still find people and colleagues today. And I watched in 2019, brilliant women come into parliament who uh, had campaigned on a range of issues. And I was suggesting to them, you know, come and sit on my select committee. Women and Equality Select Committee will be fascinating. It'll be interesting, really enjoyable for you. And they would look at me and say, I don't want to get pigeonholed only talking yeah. about women's issues. Uh, and I say, oh my goodness. Uh, and so now I'm thrilled that I have, uh, I've had three men on the committee over the course of the last uh, year. But it's absolutely crucial that we don't allow ourselves to be pigeonholed. We don't allow people to detect, well, you've had a different life biography, uh, so you will have different interests. No, make your interests. You, you didn't find that anybody treated you differently? Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, people treated me differently. I, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on this. Probably not. I was told that I had a promotion because I only had tits, um, if that's <laughs> swearing. Um, and, and yeah, sure, people have treated me in this place. Uh, very differently to it in my previous roles where I had never encountered sexism. I thought, you know, my mother had fought battles in the 1970s, so I don't have to fight battles for my daughter today. Uh, and arriving in Parliament, real wake-up call. No, I'm still fighting. It's, it's interesting because I remember when I started work as a journalist, I asked for training to go to hostile environments because I travel so much with the World Service. And they, uh, you know, the male editor at the time said that he, he thought it was really unlikely that that I'd be sent out to the field because I was so delicate. And he didn't know, but I'd come from living for two years in Congo, you know, the middle of the war. So I, I, this assumption that was made about, about you know, being a, um, being a woman in, in, in a certain situation was, was just that, it was a gendered assumption. Um, what about you? Um, Leila, do you find that there were any particular sort of, did you, have you been treated differently for being a woman in a professional capacity? Well, uh, definitely, definitely. There, there is, uh, if I get the point correctly, that uh, women now are uh, better, shall we say, treatment when they are in committee, when they are in parliament, whether when they are uh, exposed to to anything. If I got the, that, if I'm not, uh, you know, properly got the idea, you can correct me. Uh, uh, but you can find that in our society, different places and different issues. Like we have, should we say, two peoples in one country? <laughs> you you see that in certain parts that there is. Uh, this respect, shall we say, there is this uh, giving and taking with, with women in, in other parts of uh, the country. And this might apply also to other Arab countries. Women are not uh, listened to. Mm. What we feel now within the debate in the municipalities at, at the local, very local uh, councils, uh, they, uh, uh, they don't even allow uh, the, the debate. And uh, all the women that we support when offices that they say, what's the use? Because they don't have, allow us to pass. Uh, sometimes they make trips there, they make the, the meetings late, so as women cannot attend. Or sometimes they, they, they say, we, we pass it uh, without the women voting. Uh, so we, we, we feel that in some parts, uh, we're gaining and we're listened to, and in other, uh, shall we say, more uh, marginal places, more in the province uh, municipalities, uh, women are not uh, listened to. If, mm -hmm. but from from your from the comments, but this is a strict situation, and uh, this is what we would like to all the time uh, try to introduce the method of intersectionality to include the marginalized uh, women, to include the refugee women, because they are not taken seriously and they are not listened to. And uh, I hope I hope I did answer. No, that's a, that's a great answer. In fact, Heidi, I saw you nodding along. Yeah, I, I think this is a really important point that uh, we are now starting to see that uh, discrimination in our societies takes very many different shapes and uh, sometimes uh, different forms um, uh, hit um, uh, one individual. Like if you're, a, if you're a black migrant woman in Europe, you will be certain that it's not, 
it's not easy to get into into any kind of uh, positions and influence. So I think this is something that we need to talk about and and bring into to uh, our institutions. I I remember there was a bit of a of a case when uh, our uh, green interior minister in Finland. Uh, my party leader, uh, she started to talk about uh, how important it was that uh, the new gender equality program of the government is intersectional. And then people started to say, well, what is this intersectionality? It doesn't make any sense. It probably doesn't mean anything. She's just using this word because she wants to sound like she's uh, educated or what. But of course, it has a deep sense. But, but one of the uh, challenges in politics is that you're often deliberately misunderstood it could also be true of men, of course, but I would say that women are uh, unreasonably often uh, purposefully, deliberately misunderstood or somehow played down. And, um, and then I, I see that the problem of young women now coming to politics in, in, uh, in my country, and I see it in the European Parliament, is indeed uh, what has been mentioned by Caroline, that there's so much... Um, uh, really nasty publicity in the social media that, that some, especially I've seen that young women are really uh, hit by this and that it's very discouraging and some of them decide not to candidate again or, 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 or join political uh, parties or something like this. But uh, what I would always propose is that um, in any parliament, any, organ any organization which is very much um, traditionally dominated by, by the male culture, is that women need to talk to another and organize themselves across the uh, party lines if it's a parliament. And this was actually the, the, the secret of, of the Finnish women's uh, movements that um, very early on um, in the independent Finland, women started to talk to one another uh, across party lines. And they were sort of uh, together the engine for important uh, social reforms like daycare for, for children and things like that. So, so that would be my standard proposal to any, uh, any neglected women in politics and in society to, to organize themselves across different uh, lines. We have a question through from, I was going to ask one question um, first, but it's directed at me, so I'll save that till the end because I don't think anyone's here to see me. <laughs> but um, we, we have a question through from the ambassador of Nicaragua, which is, as we enter a world recession reductions in funding for social services, uh, which have a larger impact on women, health um, and work burden, how can we protect services that are critical to women? How do we earmark um, budget and funding and how will we, well, I'm adding this last bit, but how could you be listened to in when those decisions are being made? Um, Caroline? Thank you for that. And can I just follow what Heidi said about intersectionality? You know, add to the list that she gave us age uh, and being an older woman. Uh, I, you know, I always you, say- you. no. Well, no, 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 but older women in general, I always, you know, I'm now well past middle age, um, but you know, migrant women, black women, uh, they are the ones who have uh, suffered most. And journalists always wince when I use the word intersectionality and say, please stop saying that, Caroline, nobody understands what you mean. So I always say, you know, if we're talking about uh, migrant women, women with disabilities, older women, they are the ones who uh, suffer the most discrimination, the most injustice. When it comes to services, I think this is such an important point and something that my select committee has been uh, calling for in the last uh, report we published on the gendered economic impact of COVID. And I have absolutely said, yes, earmark programs specifically for women. We know that women have been most impacted through the jobs that they have been doing. They uh, are in sectors which are more likely to be shut down and shut down for longer. They have been more likely to be furloughed than their male colleagues, mm -hmm. so receiving less income. Uh, and so my plea to the Chancellor, so far not responded to, is look at your Build Back Better program look at the, uh, the policies and programs you're putting in place for retraining uh, and make sure that some of them are earmarked for women. Recognize that we need to encourage women out of stereotypical roles because retail, as we know it, is gonna be changed irrevocably. So make sure that women who may have had a career, you know, 20, 30 years in retail, they are now at the prime of their lives. You know, women in their, women who are my age, you know, in their late forties, they still have so much more to offer. So let's make sure that they get into roles that are commensurate with their abilities, with their skills, but that they're given the retraining that they need in order to be able to do I mean, that. that. That seems like a no brainer when we're discussing in this panel, but are we, but would that be listened to when 
when you're so my, through. my challenge uh, with uh, the Treasury at the moment is that their response to me every time is we have to look at policies in the round, by which they mean for everyone. And my response is stop looking in the round, look at the people who have been hit hardest, look at the people who uh, went into this pandemic with the least, the fewest advantages and work out how we can redress that. We need to have laser-like focus on those from uh, Black, Asian, minority ethnic communities, because we know that they have been hardest hit. We need to have a focus on women. We need to make sure that disabled people whose access to services has been you know, legislated to pull back, that actually that we open that up and we move away from a, a power to provide a service and get straight back to a duty. I'm going to just answer the question for me very quickly because it's itching in my brain a bit, but, but then, I'll, then I'll throw it to Leila for the, for the second question, which is what, what responsibility and role does the media have in this social debate? And I just want to say very, very quickly that I'm not going to get into a huge um, media long drawn conversation, but one thing that I said when I interviewed for my job, because a much more famous person could have probably got this job, was... Um, several more famous people could have got this job was that I think it's really important that we um, in the media but also as politicians civil society leaders do a better job in not gatekeeping um, knowledge and and the conversations that we're happening ha that are happening within our communities because I think a lot of it can seem so inaccessible and so scary and things like politics feels like it's a million miles away and I think the best thing that all of us can do right now is to make sure that the conversations that we're having are happening transparently and in an accessible way. So, you know, I'm in Doncaster right now, but, you know, in my, in my family home, the village, everybody knows each other's name here. And I want, when I go down to the shop, Mick in the shop, to feel that he can ask me about a piece that I've got on the World Service and not feel that that is... Um, that's something that is, you know, not in his world. So I, I, that's really all I wanted to say about the, the media role in, in conversations about gender, because it, these are all scary words, you know, gender, trans, intersectionality, and, uh, but they're not scary concepts. So I hope that answers it somewhat. But um, I wanted to ask you later about this next point, which I, I, I think I pulled a face when, when I saw the question, but I didn't mean to, because I, I think it's something that I've seen on a, quite a few message boards and um, on Reddit and, and places that, that I kind of hang around, which is um, Finland and Nordic countries have indeed paved the way for equality and it looks good to me. But dare one ask if there's any research into the feminization of men? Will alpha males become extinct or can they adapt to childcare without loss of perceived loss of strength? So we've got <laughs> gender roles, perception of man, <laughs> men in this. And I'd really like your, your thoughts on this later <laughs> because it is something that I, I, I actually admire the person for asking this question because um, I, you see it in message boards all the time about this feminization of men as women get more <laughs> well, uh, in my part of the world, also feminization of women should be considered, but feminization of men is uh, a target. And uh, le let me go back a little bit uh, to speak about the media, uh, because it's very interesting in our part of the world, the media affect people a lot. Uh, maybe this is true about all over the world, but in our uh, uh, place of the world, it is when it is a combination of the media and gender, uh, they, they play a big role. And it is up till now in my country, it is uh, uh, the hatred speech. Mm. So, yeah, so severe, the, the attacks on uh, gender equality and the attacks on women, uh, feminists, and now the social media is taking this uh, new, uh, shall we say, weapon against women, <laughs> sort of. Uh, and uh, we do have a, a leader who is uh, very progressive, and she's uh, the one who calls for feminization of men. She's the head of the Commission for Women in Jordan. And the attack is there and there and all the time people asking her why don't you uh, just sue them because we do have the crime electronic crime uh, cyber crime whatever cyber it is crime, called. Yeah. 
Mm. He says, no, I'm against, against this law. So I cannot use it against them. So, uh, we so is, she, is, she, is she saying that she supports feminization of men? Or? But for, for us, uh, we're not at that, uh, at that stage. Though in the civil society, you find very progressive men and they support us. Whenever you say a human rights organization, you take it for granted in this part of the world that they are uh, pro-women. They are uh, uh, in the process of feminization of men. We find them and they support us a lot. And in the, in the civil society, it is better. But if you go outside that, shall we say, the socialist uh, people, people who are pro-politics, so I'm not afraid of, of being, uh, you know, involved in politics, you find uh, very, uh, very progressive men and uh, they are very much oriented and uh, supportive, as I said. But this is a tiny, tiny portion. Mm -hmm. We need, we need to go around and increase and increase. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you think of this part of the world, the, the journey is very, uh, is longer. And I got uh, interested when the question that you told us about, how do we work when it comes to projects and support and services and all these. In this part of the world, the governments, they don't, they don't support civil society. And on the, on the other hand, the, the shrinking space is there, you know, uh, even for, for approval of projects. So the projects and the, the money support that was there is, is not uh, free. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have to ask for approval and the approval needs, you know, the history of every donor and the history of every group and as if, as if uh, this uh, uh, is not enough. Uh, so the media, the media plays a role in in uh, in accusing all those working in the in the civil society. They are agents for the West. You know this. <laughs> We, we're coming, sorry, I hate to cut you off, Leila, because I think you're raising so many excellent points, but we're at the last couple of minutes, so I just wanted to, I just wanted to take this final thought, and I'd like, um, and if you could all give me an answer each of, of a minute or less, which is, you know, this, which is from um, Katrina, which is, how, what can we do individually and in, a, in the kind of the groups that we're in, to support women in their careers to become leaders. And I, I just wanted to say one quick thing that I read this something about in the Obama administration, the women who worked in that administration did this thing called amplification, where if one woman had an idea, a second woman would repeat the idea and say, you know, Hades idea da, 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 or Layla's idea, just to make sure that no man could take credit for it. So I just wanted to throw that in. But Hedy, what, what are your thoughts for that? And we've got, yeah, just yeah, two yeah. Go, it's so. just, it's just 10 seconds on that. This is the great recipe against patriarchy who like to repeat and praise each other, you know. So the women need to do the same uh, to make women visible. But um, um, I really believe that um, this kind of um, uh, common learning together in in uh, in groups uh, where you have women and maybe you can have a few progressive men there as well is 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 a way to to encourage uh, women to be active wherever they are. And um, my last comment on the earlier question on on um, savings and um, and recession and social um, social uh, revenues is that um, and and costs is that we need to have this kind of new concept of economy and. In Finland, we would call it economy of well-being. This is another um, uh, smart concept that has actually find its way to, 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 to EU uh, discussions as well. So economy has a very strong well-being element. When people are well, the economy is well as well. And we can do all these uh, impact assessments that, uh, that were mentioned to find out what the impact on, on uh, I mean, sorry, Heidi, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut you off just because yes. I want just one word from from Caroline and Layla. Just if you could just say <clears> one <throat> word how we could support each other because we're in the last sort of less than thirty seconds to go. Caroline, you, you find brilliant women and you ask them to stand. Brilliant women, ask them to stand. Layla, one sentence or less. <laughs> one word is solidarity. 
Solidarity. Brilliant. And we've hit at one o'clock. So happy International Women's Day to the panel. Thank you so much for hosting us, European mm -hmm. Parliament. And um, we, there was a comment earlier about how can we do more conversations like this? And I, I think that we should, and we shouldn't just limit it to International Women's Day. So that's my point. But thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.